Hi, this is Dee with University of San Diego Career Development Center. Welcome to Alumni Zoom Trips, a series of pre-recorded interviews with USD alumni experts about how to navigate the long-term impact of COVID-19 on our communities and workplaces. This program is co-hosted with the Office of Alumni Relations. Joining today's episode from Tucson, Arizona is Sandra Nathan, Interim Executive Director of the Astrea Lesbian Foundation for Justice that works to secure human rights for underserved LGBTQ communities. Sandra holds a sociology degree from USD, MA from National University, and a certificate in nonprofit leadership from Harvard University. She has over 20 years experience in executive management with experience in philanthropy, government, and the not-for-profit sector. She also has an extensive policy experience at the national and local levels, having worked for the City of San Francisco, Santa Clara County, and National Council on Aging. She's deeply committed to advancing racial equity and social justice as demonstrated by her leadership and strategic partnerships and programs at Community Foundation for Southern Arizona, AIDS Emergency Fund, Breast Cancer Emergency Fund, Marin Community Foundation, among many others. Sandra, um, it's an honor and pleasure to meet you virtually. Um, you have studied, lived, and worked and worked throughout the country and across various um, sectors. Um, how is it different to um, work for the not-for-profit sector versus the government? How are they the same? Uh, what would you say are the rewarding and challenging aspects of each? Oh, thank you, first of all, Dee. I'm delighted to uh, participate on this call and to, uh, to represent uh, the class of 1970 <laughs> as an alumni. Um, yeah, so as you've highlighted, I've had um, just a really rich and varied career. I've worked in the nonprofit sector, I've worked in government, um, and uh, I'm currently working in philanthropy. And so to answer your question about, uh, you know, the differences between the nonprofit sector and government, um, government is basically there to provide for essential services for, for citizens, whether it's at the municipal level, the state level, the federal level, um, and you're working within an environment of um, rules, regulations, you know, uh, specific needs for compliance. Um, and whether you're in a leadership position in government or regardless of the level, you know, you're there to serve the public. Um, you know, you're there as a, uh, as a servant leader, if you will. Um, so in that sense, working in government is very similar to working in a nonprofit organization. You're there to, uh, within a nonprofit organization, organization, you're there to advance the mission and vision and purpose of that nonprofit organization, and you're there to serve the constituency of the organization in a way that's very similar to uh, the role that you play within government. So there's a lot of crossover. I will say that working in government um, provides you with uh, stronger guardrails, if you will. Um, you know, there are limitations to what you can do and how you can do it. Mm -hmm. And working in the nonprofit sector, you certainly are able to provide um, creative leadership and uh, leadership that is much more responsive and, um, and focused on the most immediate needs of, uh, of the organization that you're leading. Thanks so much uh, for that, Sandra. And um, what, what kinds of challenges has COVID-19 um, created for the not-for-profit sector and how are you currently addressing them? Yes, yeah, so um, for the nonprofit sector in general, I feel that the COVID-19 epidemic is really hitting nonprofits extremely hard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the pandemic hit and for many nonprofits, it completely upset the way that they are able to operate. Um, many have had to move, um, as I have, uh, you know, leading a, a public foundation uh, to a remote operation. Um, many nonprofit organizations, especially those that are smaller nonprofits, are extremely reliant on fundraising events and they've had to suspend those fundraising events. Mm -hmm. uh, many have made efforts to move those events online, but as you can imagine, if you're if you're basing a substantial amount of um, your budget on the revenue that you're generating from one or two events and you're not able to hold those events, 
you've got a very deep hole to fill. Um, so many nonprofits have not only had to suspend those events where they are generating revenue, but they've had to furlough staff, lay off staff. Um, and uh, I was reading a report recently uh, that basically highlighted that 20% of the nonprofit organizations in Los Angeles have had to close their doors and risk uh, the prospect of not being able to reopen. So if you can imagine the impact of COVID-19 yeah, in one city and multiply that across the country, you know, I would argue that we're looking at a sector that's in deep trouble. Um, and um, many nonprofits don't have the cash reserves to, to weather uh, a pandemic like COVID-19. And so I feel that there are going to not only be um, the dissolution and bankruptcy of many nonprofit organizations, but we could potentially be seeing more mergers mm -hmm. um, between nonprofits where, you know, they'll have to look at ways to kind of come together with organizations uh, fulfilling similar missions and um, combine those organizations into one organizational structure. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Sandy, for that. And um, I know that Estrella Foundation is, um, as you um, told me just um, earlier to this conversation, is growing. Yes. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? I mean, how is Estrella coping with this crisis and continue to grow amid the um, amid the economic recession? Yeah. So Estrella is. Um, Australia is a global human rights and social justice uh, public foundation. We're very much like a community foundation. We raise every dollar that we give away across the globe to um, organizations that are working on the ground to uh, protect the rights of LGBTQI, trans, um, and people of color. Um, and we work both domestically as, around the as well as around the globe. Um, and so in this environment in which we've been, not just as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, but even prior to that, there's been a heightened awareness around the need to protect human rights, the, the need to protect the rights of individuals, regardless of their sexual identity or gender um, or race. And so Estrella has always been at the forefront uh, of um, fighting that fight and uh, partnering with funders to move resources into communities around the globe where um, there's the potential to have impact in that regard. Mm -hmm. So we're growing, we're partnering more with governments across the, of the globe. We are partnering with the Canadian government, with um, uh, the UK um, and uh, we have a partnership with USAID. Um, and so, you know, we have been growing because there are institutional funders out there who really understand the need to protect rights and mm -hmm. see the Australia Foundation as the partner with whom to really get resources out across the globe to organizations that are doing that work. And um, as a highly successful female African-American leader, how do you personally operate um, as a leader during this, during this time? Yeah, so, you know, as an African-American female leader, um, I've always led with a heightened sense of awareness of who I am in the world. Um, I have a profound sense of humility mm -hmm. around, um, you know, the shoulders of all the folks that I stand on from my amazing parents. As I shared with you, Dee, I grew up in San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, I am the daughter of two parents who were just amazing role models for me, um, just in terms of what it really means to, um, you know, to care about yourself, your family, um, you know, your faith, to put, you know, certainly put your faith first and foremost <laughs> in your life. Um, and so I really grew up just being undergirded with some amazing core values that have really enabled me to 
to be a successful and impactful African-American leader. But at the root of everything that I do is an awareness of who I am um, as an African-American, as a woman, and that I have a responsibility um, to lead um, and to um, go about my life in a way that um, helps me to understand that I'm not just responsible uh, for my own success, I'm responsible for creating a path um, for others to achieve that same level of success. And more importantly, regardless of the leadership role that I've played, um, to make sure that I'm uh, fostering um, an environment that calls um, out inequities, addresses those inequities, and ensures that there is uh, equal access to opportunity for everyone. Um, so I, I thank you so much. And I heard a lot of um, different elements here from having that high sense of um, awareness, others focus, um, high degree of responsibility, having those core values and humility. Um, are there any um, lessons for you, lessons in leadership for you from the current crisis? Yes, yeah, so the lessons, the key lesson um, for leadership for me in this current crisis is uh, the importance of being a resilient leader. Mm -hmm. um, um, as you know, I have been um, in executive leadership roles um, for a number of years now, and I've been through a number of crises, um, you know, but I don't think that I, in my lifetime, have experienced what we're going through as a result of this, uh, this global pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, Folks have tried to liken it to the recession of to you know the last recession that we went through in 2008 through 2012. This pales in comparison. This is impacting every aspect of our lives, and um, I don't think that anyone remotely knows how we are going to come out of this health um, pandemic and what a new normal is going to look like. Um, so I, I feel that what this pandemic is doing is um, calling our awareness to um, the systemic issues and challenges that we need to face globally. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel that it is incumbent on all of us to really to, you know, look at the ways that we can heighten our awareness of those inequities um, and to prepare ourselves to help to co-create a new world because I don't feel that we have, we'll have the opportunity or the choice or even the desire to go back to the way that the world was. Um, I'm going to follow up on that directly. And I wonder um, how you assess the impact of um, the current crisis on the lives and livelihoods of the diverse communities that you work directly with. Yeah, so I will just say very broadly that, again, uh, this pandemic has called out all the inequities that exist within our society, uh, you know, that as we, and we hear about it daily, you know, um, you know, that Black people, people of color, um, and Indigenous people um, who have faced underlying um, inequities in health, access to education, um, housing, um, access to wealth, government resources, that they're the ones who are bidding, being hit hardest by this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so again, this, this is really calling out um, these inequities. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the reality that, you know, if you are African American, you're more likely to have those underlying health conditions such as diabetes or, you know, heart disease. And if you come down with COVID-19, your prospects for recovery are not the same as they would be if you were uh, a white person. So the, the, again, it's just really, really glaring just in terms of the different experiences that communities of color are having. When you look at the reality that frontline workers um, are pr you know, primarily people of color mm -hmm. and they are the ones caring for elderly individuals in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. The elderly are also being hard hit by this pandemic and dying at disproportionate rates. Um, it's also the frontline caregivers who are caring for them who are also dying. And so 
Um, so I feel that as it relates to, to communities of color um, and, um, you know, and other individuals, we're just seeing the disproportionate impact. We're seeing the failure of our healthcare system. Um, we're seeing of our inability um, to really coalesce around, you know, a common sense of leadership in terms of who's, who's controlling this. <laughs> and so, you know, it's uh, all I can say is there's no dearth of uh, opportunities for us to look at all the things that need to be addressed after we mm -hmm. have the opportunity to come out of the hyper responsive mode that we're in currently and begin to plan for the future. Um, More intentionally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the micro level, what are some things that, um, say, people like myself can do to help alleviate the plight of the, the, the communities um, that you mentioned? Well, you know, I feel that awareness is really, really keen, um, you know, to really understand that, you know, that there are, that there are communities with, that are being disproportionately impacted you know, and that, you know, there's an opportunity, and I, I love it in New York, um, when in the evenings, you know, folks are clapping their, their hands and they're clanging pots, you know, and when folks come out of the, the hospitals, they're recognizing that folks are really putting their lives on the line, mm -hmm. you know, to care for others. So I feel that this is an opportunity for all of us to live much more deeply from our hearts you know, and to show compassion toward other individuals. Um, one of the things that I try to do when I go grocery shopping is to be mindful of who around me is struggling and, you know, to just do a random act of kindness and pay for that person's groceries if I have a, a, a feeling that they're in severe economic need. Uh, so it's just living from the heart, having the deepest awareness that there are communities and individuals for whom, you know, they may never recover from this pandemic, either because of economic, for economic reasons, they've lost their jobs, you know, those jobs have gone away, they're never coming back, um, or they're individuals who are succumbing, you know, to the pandemic because of those health disparities. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just living in an awareness that there are there are aspects of our society that are amazing, and there are aspects of our society that are calling for a complete, you know, reimagination of how we can be. And so to really bring your creativity, your passion, your commitment to engage in recreating that in any way that you can, you know, whether it's in your community, within your own family, even looking at your own life and, and how you can show up differently. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, and what would your um, advice be to our students and our alumni who are navigating through this uncertain job search market currently? Yeah, so what I'm finding is, again, we're on a growth trajectory within the Estrella Foundation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I also know that in some you know, sectors, um, there's actual some, some growth opportunities out there. Uh, companies are growing. They're looking at opportunities to um, really retool themselves, recognizing that we are moving into a whole new way of operating. So my encouragement would be to, number one, follow your passion. You know, look at ways that you have the skills and expertise to, to make a difference, um, whether it's working in a business or a corporation for government or, you know, even with a nonprofit. Um, I would say with regard to the nonprofit, make sure that it's solvent, <laughs> that you're going to have a job, <laughs> you know, the next year. Um, but I would just say, you know, this is really a, a good time, I feel, um, to be looking for opportunities. I think that many companies are now embracing remote work. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, and I see that as a positive byproduct of this uh, this pandemic that many employees, uh, particularly much younger employees, have just been insisting on more work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And so remote work, I think, is going to be, it's just going to be a given. Reality of the future. Yeah. Okay. And, and 
So, so I would just say, get out there, apply for positions. Um, don't be afraid to, you know, to put yourself in the job market. And um, this is a time when um, individuals and corporations need people who are creative um, and uh, passionate and committed and, um, and want to work. So mm -hmm. just put yourself out there. Keep on applying, right? Um, and speaking of remote uh, work, do you have any tips for individuals who are working from home or helpful practices that you've established that you wish to create, that you wish to share? Um, yeah, so for me, I, um, I will have to say that I've had to grow into an appreciation for working remotely. I really miss one on interaction with my, my staff and my, my senior management team. Um, so I've come to appreciate um, both the challenges and the opportunities of what it means to work remotely. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the first thing is to make sure that you have, you know, structure mm -hmm. uh, and that you're creating strong boundaries about when you begin work and when you end. Um, because if you are um, the kind of person like I am who tries to be responsive to every email and every phone call that you're getting, <laughs> you'll find yourself working for, you know, 14, 15 hours a day, and that's just not sustainable. So have a schedule, stick with that schedule, um, take time for breaks, make sure that you're creating space between one Zoom meeting and another, mm -hmm. um, have a bio break and grab a snack, um, take time for a walk, you know, so that you're stretching and clearing your head. Um, and then the last thing I will add is uh, be sure to wear pants. So <laughs> many people are sitting, you know, on Zoom calls looking really amazing, you know, from the top up and then, you know. And then PJs down below. No. <laughs> exactly. Make sure you're wearing pants and that they're not uh, sweatpants or, you know. <laughs> Okay, and um, again, pretty relevant um, to this. Um, what is a typical work day um, like for you and how has it changed um, over the course of this um, outbreak? Yeah, so um, my, my foundation is based in New York City, as I shared with you. So um, currently I'm on um, in a di different time zone. So I've had to adjust my work hours to working, starting my day much earlier. Um, so I'm generally up by 5.30 or 6. Um, I'm a runner, so I get out and run every day and meditate and try to eat breakfast. And then I'm usually starting my work day at about 7.30 or 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and because I also have staff working in different time zones, many, many days I'll have extended days where I'm working until like six or seven o'clock in the evening, my time. So that's why I'm encouraging folks who have the ability to do it to really make sure that you have boundaries around when you begin and end your day. Because if you're working in an environment like mine, you really have to be flexible, you have to be adaptive, and uh, that can mean very long work hours, so. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sandra. And um, can you tell our listeners a little bit about how your USC degree has prepared you for your career? Yeah, so, um, so my degree is in sociology and um, sociology is one of just those gener generic areas, if you will, there, you know, it's, it's almost sort of multidisciplinary um, because it, uh, it's so broad it really prepared me for just about anything, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so when I decided to, uh, to go to graduate school and, and you know, to have a, a specialty, it was out of awareness that my Bachelor of Arts degree was in sociology um, and that I had multiple paths, if you will, um, from which to launch that degree. Um, and my initial career started out as, as you know, um, in government. My first job was with San Diego County. Um, and so I really had expected to have a public sector career, um, primarily focused on social work. Um, and I discovered gerontology, which was at that time a discipline of social work. 
Um, and then my master's degree is in public administration. And so that sort of um, built upon my, my desire. Public sector to background. And, mm -hmm. The public sector. Um, so my degree prepared me, I feel, um, just to have a very, very um, broad focus mm -hmm. and, um, and to, to have uh, and embrace um, various um, paths, if you will, for my career. And I, I feel like I've maximized on all of them. <laughs> That's wonderful. Is there anything you miss about USD? You know, when I, when I was a student at USD, um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was very much a safe haven. Um, I, I will have to just sort of reflect on the reality that I had a very sheltered life growing up and being at USD really extended that sense of safety and security and shelteredness. I was nurtured. I was loved, I was appreciated as a student, um, and USD was very much um, an, an extension of my home and community in that way for me. So I've always looked back on my years at USD as uh, of, of years that really provided me with the opportunity to, to grow and to, to, to feel nurtured and cared for and um, to be prepared, if you will, to, to, to be in the world the way that I am today. So I really valued that experience. Thanks for sharing that, Sandy. And um, so my last two questions are going to be, um, for our uh, mid-career alumni um, who are in transition, what are some ways that they can reinvent their careers, especially during this time? Yes, yeah, so um, I have reinvented myself so many times, I can't <laughs> begin to describe them, <laughs> you know, from being on a career path that was very focused on the public sector and getting to, um, I would say, a fairly senior level uh, in the public sector as deputy county executive for Santa Clara County, which, uh, you know, is like the third largest county in the state of California. Um, and then realizing that um, I really had a passion for philanthropy. And so I reinvented myself and moved into philanthropy and then have woven in and out of the nonprofit sector um, in various um, snippets and time, time points in my career. Um, so I will just say that I feel that there, you know, the world is calling for people who have uh, expertise. Um, I feel that there is a real opportunity for the generations to work side by side with each other and to, you know, to learn and to grow from each other. I feel that particularly people in mid-career mm -hmm. um, levels, um, you know, still have opportunities to move into, you know, senior level positions um, to shift sectors and to continue to make contributions. And um, I just would encourage them to, to not, you know, just hang up their shingle and go off and retire um, because the world really, really needs all of us to show up, I think, in a really profound kind of way. So um, the world needs mid-career individuals, and so I just would encourage folks to really look at opportunities to and to keep on trying. Yeah, mm -hmm. to see where they can make a difference. And you know, it's not to say that there aren't um, obstacles. You know, there I would you know just will argue that sometimes when you're in a mid-career um, jobs, you know, you're at a mid-career le level and you're looking for a position. You know, you can be um, overlooked, you know, because there is a concern that you only have X number of years to work in a position and the tendency might be higher to, you know, to hire someone younger with lesser experience. But I will argue that I feel that those situations are becoming less and less a reality mm -hmm. uh, because up until we hit this pandemic and are now in an economic crisis, we, we had reached such a low level of unemployment that um, age discrimination just was out the door. It was like, if you want a job, we want you. If you meet the requirements of the, this position, you know, you have an opportunity here. 
So I hope that we don't lose that um, as we go through what I think will be the next two to three years of right-sizing our economy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just would encourage again, individuals at mid-career or even retirement age, you know, to just continue to look at how you can make a difference, whether it's paid work or volunteer work. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for that inspiration, Sandra. And then um, on, to end with, um, what is something that you've learned later in life um, but wish you knew much earlier? Uh, the importance of dancing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've learned. Tell, yeah, tell, tell I, us more. What's that? Tell, tell us more. Yeah, so I, and, and when I say dancing, I'm just connecting to to creating more opportunities for fun and lightness in life. You know, I, I have to reflect that I've been, uh, you know, I've been pretty serious uh, throughout my life around, you know, just really being of service, really being a leader um, mm -hmm. and have not taken as many opportunities as I feel I should have just to, to be light and enjoy life. And so mm -hmm. um, I've discovered dancing. I love to dance. Mm -hmm. um, I played the cello when I was in um, high school, and so I've rediscovered playing the cello. And so I'm just reconnecting to all the things that uh, enable me to just laugh and enjoy life. And so. Well, that's, that's just a great uh, way to, to really um, to end this conversation. I'd like to thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, for sharing your inspirational story and your and for your time today. Delighted.